My name is Rhapsody, and I am garbage at RTS games, but I absolutely love them. The problem, as I figured out, was that I got to play a fun little opener in every RTS game where I would, uh, you know, construct a city, I would deal with my build order, I would manage my resources, I'd manage my workers and things like that. And all of that I found very enjoyable, and then an enemy would send someone at me. Probably a scouting unit, really, not something that was actually intended to take out my base. But I have built no military. I focused exclusively on my production, always just on the building that I can get done in my own base. I effectively wanted to turtle without having a shell. And of course, as the enemy would be sent at me, suddenly I have to divert 50% of my resources to try and defend myself, and everything collapses, and I lose very, very quickly. Despite knowing that pattern in myself, I don't change the way I play. I really am the Age of Empires player who just wanted to never see another player and build my wonder and win the game myself. A thought occurs, what if I just played a city builder instead of a PvP RTS? And a game occurs. Against the Storm is a roguelite city builder from Eremite Games that we're going to be diving into right about now we have done a take a peek on this earlier so if you would like to watch that that is going to be linked in the description down below but if you haven't that is a-okay the opening of any new file here is going to be a very small tutorialization of the game itself which we will speed our way on through and get into our first mission as soon as we possibly can for the moment let me click that play button and let the game tell you what it's about Viceroys, a pioneer sent into the wilds, tasked with establishing new settlements and acquiring valuable resources for the crown. Your goal is to help rebuild the smoldering city and secure the future of the queen's subjects. Excellent, excellent. I intend to do that with style and aplomb. The Queen's Envoy has asked me to control the camera, which I know about. I have played video games before. The Queen's Envoy also says, Neglecting your village will increase the Queen's impatience and bring her wrath down upon you. Which is introducing our first, uh, I guess you might call it a loss condition, right? The Queen's impatience filling at any point is the end of the game for us. Fulfilling your duties will increase the town's reputation. Unlock new buildings, and eventually bring you to victory. Grr. I mean, it kind of does look like a crow. I absolutely have to lean that voice. Now, choose a new blueprint. Click on the crown icon below. So in doing so, I will be offered blueprints that will allow me to collect or, uh, or distribute or process resources. Here we're offered the woodcutter's camp. Each expedition starts with only a few essential blueprints. More will be given to you as you earn reputation points. Now, pick the woodcutter's camp. I'll pick that. Starting point for woodcutters. For space to resume, we also do have access up here to the ability to speed the game up to a total of three times. Build a woodcutter's camp and explore the forest. You have to keep the fire going at all times. The fire in particular they are referencing here being the small hearth. This is the home of our civilization in the wilderness here. And the fuel that is allowed to burn is coal, sea marrow, bone, uh, sorry, sea marrow, which is uh, kind of bone-ish, uh, oil, and wood. For the moment, I won't read out any of the rest of that screen, but I will go to winning and losing in Against the Storm. You build not one, but many settlements. To successfully establish a town and win a run, you need to collect enough reputation points to fill the entire reputation bar, which is blue. It's important to do this before the Queen's Impatience Red reaches its maximum. If she loses her patience, you will lose, and you'll also lose if all of your villagers leave or die. Let's get a woodcutter's camp down. We can obviously see a radius around it that it is capable of operating within. Uh, I'm gonna I'm a nestle it all up in this corner. There we go. And fun little advanced tech, I'm going to start building some paths, noting that 
This is a strategy game and we have villagers that carry resources. They will move faster on those paths, I am certain of it. I also know it for a fact. It gives a 5% speed increase to villagers. So now we're being offered our first order. The order immediately chosen for us here, otherwise we will usually have the ability to influence this ourselves, is to have two woodcutter camps and 10 wood produced by those camps. As a reward, we will get three new beavers, so that's three new villagers for ourselves to put to work immediately doing woodcutting, especially with the reinforced axes perk. Woodcutting is way easier. Woodcutting camps produce 40% faster. Okay, so let's get the second woodcutter's camp down, and I'll try and make it a little bit further away from the original. There we go. And give it a path as well. This second building that we see here is our main warehouse. It stores a large amount of goods and protects them from the rain. Workers will always deliver and take goods from the warehouse nearest to them. So this can be a bottleneck. But it's going to be something that we're going to be building, you know, sprawling out from. So it'll certainly be the central point for a while until we start doing things like build outposts. That's all later tech though. Don't let me get ahead of myself. These woodcutters are obviously not doing anything because I haven't put anyone in them to work. So we can see the little sigil above them saying no workers are assigned to the building. Uh, we open the panel and it tells us that the woodcutters camp is the starting point for woodcutters going out into the wild to cut trees. Specialization bonus of wood. So the beavers, I happen to know, are hardworking and honest, but also quite demanding. And they're gifted woodworkers and enjoy engineering. So I'm going to put the beavers in there as a priority. And in fact, hovering over them, we can see that they are proficient here. This worker has a 10% chance of doubling their yield. Neat. Uh, also, the second camp is not currently being utilized, so I'm just going to throw three humans in there. And keep the game on three times speed to move through this at quite a clip. So we now hand in our first order. We also note, by the way, there is one extra resource that I did not mention as a reward from this, and that is Queen's Grace. We are gonna be getting one reputation, which is one notch of the blue success bar. Uh, we're also now being opened, uh, sorry, opened. We're now being asked to open two glades, which are the pockets in the map that are not trees, and have five uh, beavers as woodcutters at any one time. We're also getting three humans and 30 meat, as well as a queen's reputation for having done so. Let's sub out the new beavers I got for the people in that woodcutting camp, and that'll set us up perfectly. So I can start marking trees for harvest. Useful when trying to carve a path to nearby glades, hold shift for a smaller marker, and hold control to exclude trees on the edges of glades. Hold alt to clear mark trees instead. So. I'm gonna hold shift and try and cut through a path into this glade. Just one tree needs to be taken down for me to look into that little pocket there. As soon as we knock that tree down, we'll discover what is in here and start dealing with it. In fact, the game is about to tell us a little bit about that. Although you're surrounded by entirely a thick forest, almost entirely rather a thick forest, there are smaller and bigger glades around your starting location. To establish a successful settlement, you'll have to cut your way through to them. Glades can contain resources, treasures, fertile soil, ruined buildings, and more. Use the tree marking tool, the axe icons on the right-hand side of the lower HUD, to point your woodcutters to specific areas of the forest that they should prioritize. The best rewards come from dangerous or forbidden glades marked with a skull icon. But these will also all have at least one dangerous glade event within them, which will require you to deliver certain goods or complete a challenge to complete them. It's also worth noting that while those dangerous glaive events, uh, glaive, glade events are active rather, uh, and unsolved, they will give you negatives to the rest of your area. So you don't want to discover them and then try and scramble for how you will solve them. You want to have some general solutions at hand and then encounter an event, at least in my experience. Which is a little bit minimal. It could be entirely wrong. Who knows as of yet? You can also choose a new blueprint at the moment, so we'll do that. Getting a shelter. It can accommodate any villager, but it won't satisfy the need for sp uh, species-specific housing. 
has to be built near a hearth, and there are three places in it. So currently, over on the left panels here, I can see that I have three races. I've got the lizards, I've got the beavers, and I've got the humans. And I've also got six beavers total, three lizards, and three humans. Giving me a total of 12 folk here at the moment. We can also see on that same panel, the population at the very top. We can see how many of them are builders, which is free workers. So people that are not otherwise already ascribed a job. So they are free to build things that I should happen to set up. Uh, and then at the very bottom, we see the homeless. So we see the number of our units of each race that are unhoused here. So I have the ability to know very, very quickly at a glance, I only have to have 12. So if I build four shelters, that's enough to put 12 characters in homes. I should also probably set up a specific tree path through to this glade. There we go. Okay, looks like we'll have the first glade open in a very, very short period of time. Come on, there we go. Immediately we see some resources in here, a stormbird nest and a root deposit, each of them small. Unfortunately, we do not have any of the camps that would be required to interact with these, so we cannot loot them of their resources. But they do contain eggs and meat and roots and herbs. All the kinds of things that I've not otherwise yet had access to. We've also got a moss broccoli patch here, which I could collect with a forager's camp, but I do not have the blueprint for that just yet. Uh, ooh, interesting. A flax field in this area as well. Also something that I can't access, but that is okay. Opening those two glades has completed our order, giving us three new humans, 30 meat, and one queen's grace. Ah, very neat. So the objective is to have a forager's camp up and also get five vegetables from that forager's camp. And here's something we will also start to see increasingly. A reward that is a perk. So the perk here is plus one to vegetable production. Gain additional vegetables every yield from farming, gathering, or production. So this is asking me to set up some vegetable production, and in reward, it is giving me increased vegetable production. Me. Let's immediately take the forager's camp that they will offer us naturally. Use that here making it extremely nearby our main storage. Should be absolutely trivial to get that done. As quickly as possible. I mean, it's trivial to get it done because it's in a tutorial. It's trivial to get it done immediately, hopefully. Mark trees for harvest. We don't need to mark anything in particular at this point. Just get some folk to jump into the forager's camp. Now, the forager's camp also has a specialization bonus for farmers. And I happen to know that humans are adept at farming. They also really enjoy brewing and they're susceptible to the rain. Let's get two humans in that foraging camp. I mean, yeah, I could build another woodcutter's camp and stuff like that. But the thing is, what I'm really being gated by right now is just the completion of these orders. So I should just focus exclusively on them, I believe. Although I do have, you know, six people ready to build whatever, ready to be employed in whatever position. There we go, first handed in, and now we're getting a stonecutter's camp and clay in that camp, as well as steel shovels for increased production of clay. Similar situation to the previous one, but just introducing us to another one of the core camps that we are going to need here in the stonecutter's camp. Stonecutter's camp is a starting point for stonecutters going out into the wild to collect stone, clay, or marrow. Here on this map, we have access to clay. Uh, sure, one more path just there. Although, unfortunately, there's no specialization in the Stonecutter's Camp, so I'm just going to employ two lizards there. One thing as well is there's actually a specialization in the small hearth itself. You need a firekeeper, and the specialization itself is warmth. 
So thankfully, we already have a lizard in that area because lizard fire keepers are very adept at ancient rites, so they give one to the global resolve. We'll look at resolve later, but the lizard themselves is also getting plus five to their resolve because they're comfortable in the area near that warmth. What with the lizards being very good at animal and meat production and prefer to work in warm environments due to their cold-blooded nature. Oh, if only I hadn't paused, I would already have the clay in the stonecutters camp. Okay, again, they give us the same opportunity, a harvester camp and plant fibers being harvested. Beautiful. I mean, this one's, again, exceptionally close to the base, should complete very, very quickly for us. So the resources we're using to construct these are 10 wood and three parts, as well as obviously time and one builder but the most important thing i have to mention regarding that is that you can move buildings for completely free and when you deconstruct them you get back all of the resources you use to build them at least in my experience so far so this as i mentioned in the take a peek episode uh it, this really helps to defeat the sense of perfectionism i would otherwise have with my initial setup and the way that you know being hemmed in by the possibility of what if I find something good and then I need to replace this entire area? Oh no, I'm losing so much resource power for doing so. Also, part of my heart is just going to want to make this area look neat. So the ability to move things after I've, you know, exhausted resources in a specific area, oh, it just makes my heart sing. Let's get a couple of harvesters in the harvesters camp. Again, no specialization for them. Read more logistics. Every building has its own internal storage, where produced and gathered goods are temporarily stored. When the internal storage reaches its limit, they are produced uh, or transported to the main warehouse by a worker. While transporting, it's important to keep in mind that villagers have an internal limited carry capacity, depending on their profession and active perks, and they may need to walk between their workplace and the main warehouse multiple times. Every few minutes, workers take breaks as well, returning to the nearby hearth to eat and drink during a break. They will consume at least one item of food and try to fulfill all of their needs, clothing and services. We'll get more into that later. Uh, if a villager has multiple needs tied to complex food, they will consume more than one meal. Goods kept in the building's internal storage are inaccessible to other villages or production buildings and have to be transported to the main warehouse before they can be further distributed or consumed. That is going to make a lot more sense as we start to get things that are going to be consumed in that kind of a way. So the game will introduce it to us relatively soon like. Turn in this order. The game is now asking for four planks, four fabric and four brick. And in reward will give us 10 parts and a workstation upgrade. Uh, that workstation upgrade in particular pretty relevant because the building that we are going to be using to create those planks, bricks and fabric is itself the workstation. So it's also worth noting the crude workstation is what the game is calling the uh, base version by default here. It takes us five wood to build, but it's not good at making any of these things. You have to put a lot more resources and time in in order to get the actual result. So we'll be optimizing later. Currently it takes eight planks, sorry, eight wood to make two planks. Later, with more specialized buildings, it may cost two wood to make two planks. You can see the ridiculous difference in efficiency between the two. Let's immediately staff you fully. Four planks, bricks, and fabric. Unfortunately, now it is just time. Only one more order to complete, giving us one more blueprint reward, and then one thereafter. This will complete the first tutorial for us. But there are there is one more on its heels to add additional complexity here. So... Ah... <sighs> One moment, please. Apologies about that. I thought I was going to be able to deal with the uh, noise pollution without having to sweat all day. Alas. So, newcomers, 
Pervin Runebrook. Runebeak, rather, the royal stormwalker. These people have been sent here by the crown. Which group do you want to stay, Viceroy? The others will continue on to the next settlement. Uh, we can have two humans as well as ten grain, or we can have a beaver or a human, five vegetables, five leather. Sorry, three leather and three stone. I'm going to take the one with the beaver. Not that I think it will matter a huge amount here. So we can see, obviously, the production going on of the planks we need, and of the fabric we need, and the bricks and all. Here in the crude workstation. Come on, building blocks. You're on your way to done. I mean, it says currently, we can see by hovering over this, uh, this area right here, uh, that I have no planks, that I have no fabric, and I have no bricks. Wait, no, it says I have two bricks now. Oh, that's, that's in, the, no, it's not in this storage. It's in the main warehouse. I have two bricks. So what's going on here is the, the, the planks that I have and the fabric that I have already stored in this crude workstation is not counting, but it is counting towards building blocks. It's not counting towards the inventory size though. At least I can still track it through the order. And just deliver the rest of them. I know you have them. There you go. That's the fabric. That's the planks. I almost want to try and force them to deliver immediately. There you go. Actually, they don't even need to deliver. The uh, quest will just accept that we have produced them. Dangerous glade. We must cut through to one forest for one dangerous or forbidden glade as well as gain a ancient tablet, a valuable source of knowledge, highly sought by traders and the queen herself. They can be found in dangerous or forbidden glades. We also get 30 amber for completing this, as well as one more queen's grace. Upon getting that final queen's grace, we will just win immediately. So, where's one of these danger glades? I mean, this isn't apparently a dangerous glade, neither this. This one is though. So let's take our woodcutter's camp and move it further up here. I'm actually going to take both of my woodcutter's camps just so that I have as many woodcutters as possible working on this. And then I just need to cut a line directly through into there. All right. Chop, chop, get to it, woodworkers. Now the blueprint needs to be selected at this point. That is a beaver house, a human house, or a lizard house. Noting that we have more... I, I guess we have more diverse resources. And we have equal amounts of humans and beavers. I'll take the human house. I mean, we can start trying to build that, but it's not required at all for this. I think instead we should probably just stay on track. Given the opportunity here to take a cornerstone. No one can weather the storm alone. The queen offers you a cornerstone that will lay the foundation of your town's prosperity. Choose wisely, you won't be able to change it. We get a choice here between the exploration contract, the Royal Academy wants a detailed map of the region, is willing to supply anyone who will help. Uh, we gain 20 reed and 20 clay for each discovered glade. Will this immediately give me 40 for the two that I have discovered? Or will it only be on discovery of a glade? Carpenter's tools, uh, plus 50%. Building materials are the foundation of every settlement. Production's 50% faster in crude workstation. Well, I'm gonna take this and see. Actually, hang on. What was the impact it was gonna have? 20 reed and clay, so. You know, resources, I do not have any reeds. So that would tend to suggest that this will take place on discovering a new glade. No, I'm not taking issue with wording. It's specifically just that I need to know the impact of that because there will be a future where I am about to pop into two different glades and want to take that as a heavy priority because that is a lot of resources it's offering. Here is our first glade danger event. Glade events are often found in the forest, like abandoned caches, survivor ruins, 
sorry, survivor camps, ruins, wild beasts, etc. Some of them are positive, offering goods or new villages in exchange for small amounts of resources. Others are dangerous, forcing you to act quickly to avoid negative resources. And they give you generous rewards when you complete them. So I'm just going to cut off the rest of that and say that each of these is also going to be effectively dealt with like a job. So the requirements here are saying that I need to have five planks, I need to have six, uh, sorry, five fabric, and I need to have 10 simple tools. Or the alternative, I can put five planks or I can put 20 wood in. I can put five fabric or I can put five bricks in. Each of these little rotatey symbols tells me that there is an alternative I could put in there instead if I only have that. Uh, let's take a couple of people out of their tasks. We'll note that the amount of time that it takes to complete this, one minute, decreases as I add more people to the event. So now it's only 30 seconds to complete. Which is actually very important because it has a threat that's going to activate in 42 seconds. That threat, Curse of the Forefathers, disturbing the ruins of the Great Civilization, can have grave consequences, pun not intended, kills three random villagers. So ideally, we will complete the task before that occurs. Ah, and no, we're not going to be able to because we haven't even started delivering its requirements. We need all of these people to actually deliver the goods first, and then they can get to work. So unfortunately, yeah, I've lost a couple of folk there. I'm going to take another... Actually, I don't need to take another person away from stone cutting because they were already taken away from stone cutting. There we go. Just going to make sure that I still have a full amount of people to deal with the ancient shrine. This, of course, housing the ancient tablet that is going to be our final part of this first tutorial. Hell yeah. Thankfully, we have a lot more freedom in the second tutorial as well. And by the third, that is to say, by the third match, uh... No more tutorials, no more handrails. It is just what do you want to do and how do you want to do it? Ancient tablets. Accepting that completes our Queen's Grace. Settlement is now complete. The settlements means secure. There is one more test of our skills, however. We also get 70 experience to a level for our general viceroydom. That is us, the character who is doing the planning of these settlements. We'd also unlock 10 in the food stockpiles, a basic currency in the realm. Workers are eager to exchange their labor for food for their families. Uh, can be used to buy upgrades in the smoldering city, which we'll see just in a little bit here. But first, unlocked content. It shows that we have the woodcutters camp, the stonecutters camp, the harvesters camp, the scavengers camp, crude workstation, small hearth, warehouse, trading post, and farm field. All of these are now basically available for me at the start of a run, so I do not need to discover them through blueprints. So thankfully, now I actually do have the ability to really define what I want to do. So the Queen's Envoy says, Villagers with low resolve will start leaving, increasing the Queen's impatience. Keeping resolve exponentially, exceptionally high, rather, will grant passive reputation over time. So we can see the blue mark there being the mark above which we will have high resolve and obviously down at zero it's pretty low resolve. Or negative. You can get lower than that. Satisfying your villagers. Satisfying your villagers' needs with complex food, homes, and services will increase their resolve. So these are the needs of each individual character. They do not need all of them. We get to choose which of these we satisfy and how much we satisfy each of them. Uh, the first is sheltered. They literally just want to be in a home. And then they care about the specificity of the home as a different task. Human housing as well as sheltered. They also quite like jerky, these humans. Biscuits as well. And pie, I mean, damn, agreed so far. Clothing, no, we're off board. Leisure, back on board. And, okay, back off board. But humans do like a large variety of kinds of things here that we will be able to provide to them, hopefully with ease. Each species has a different mix of needs. It's hard to please everyone all the time. Farmers can only plant on farm fields, and those can only be built on fertile soil. Er, crops are planted in the first season. Drizzle. And harvested in the second. Clearance. Build a farm, harvest grain, and serve some ale in a tavern. Eh. 
Excellent. So we can see here the fertile soil that they are talking about. Let me choose a blueprint to get a small farm. The small farm has an area of effect around itself that we can currently see. Uh, so I'm going to try and get all of those farm fields to be within this. And I can do that by only covering two farm fields if I put it at the top there. Uh, I can do it by... I, I miss out on one and I cover one here. But it's also slightly closer to the workstation. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to cover two. That's fine. Let's also set up the farm fields there. Beautiful. Actually, I kind of almost want to double up on this. How many villages do I have at the moment? I have nine. Uh, okay, I probably shouldn't double up on this. When I say double up on this, I would mean build another small farm down in this area. Although eventually that may be the direction we want to go in. Um, first off, I should probably also just get some woodcutters out there. Mm, let's go with up here and then just immediately try and cut left also got to remember to put down the paths with a little bit of extra movement speed for our characters beauty and in fact I also know hang on how much wood do we have we don't have that much wood uh, I'm going to build a second woodcutter in order to support what I also want to do immediately, which is start housing all of our folks. Read more about reputation points. Ah, here we go. This is very, very important because so far the game has said, okay, you've got these orders, those orders give you reputation points, and when you have enough reputation points, you win the game. Are there any way other than orders in order to get those reputation points? And yes, indeed there are. You can gain reputation points in three different ways. You can complete orders, you can explore your surroundings, or you can just keep your villagers very happy. If you just have a efficient enough base, and like this baby here has got quite high resolve, they'll just give you reputation over time. So the efficiency of your base can easily be the way that you decide to win. Orders are straightforward. You get one reputation point for completing them. Uh, to gain reputation for villagers' well-being, you need to put them above their reputation threshold and they'll start generating them passively. Uh, and you can also do it from exploring. Uh, with time, it's also worth noting, your villagers will become accustomed to their living conditions and the reputation threshold will increase, forcing you to satisfy more complex needs. Excellent. Some perks or goods can also be bought from traders that can increase your reputation, something that I don't really think I've explored that much myself. Let's try and get this building to happen at Hyperlight speed. Our first objective is to have a small farm as well as a farm field. That is A-OK. -okay. I am already working on that. Let's get two humans in the farm, noting again that they have a specialization for farming. And then turn in the order immediately. Now it's asking for two woodcutters camps and two shelters. Wow, way ahead of the game. To be fair, I did play this tutorial a couple of days ago again for the Raps and Teague Take a Peek. So, sure, maybe it's fresh in my mind. But to me, I didn't think I was pulling that from anywhere. Let's let's make this shelter. Oh, wow, I didn't actually have shelter as a home that I was already able to do. Whoops. Uh, okay. Let's go there and there. And ultimately, what I do want is three of these. Because I have nine people. Whoa, hang on. No, I have more than nine people. I accepted two more humans at some point with the completion of the first order, I imagine. There we go. You'll note that I have a couple of things that I really like doing with my district. I really, really like using the fact that the ancient hearth itself is a 4x4 to set up shelters next to it as another 4x4 so that I can kind of develop almost like village blocks. Let's get some wood cutting. Thank you. Start bringing home the logs. I'll actually also set up my second woodcutter in a slightly different area to this, actually. Yeah, I'm going to move this. I'm also going to 
prevent the production of the paths there. I'm gonna move this woodcutter's camp to be there. The idea here is that now I intend to possibly free the all of the foliage that is directly below those trees, and then I can build another small farm if I want to. Let's get a cornerstone. Okay, so I could have a barrel de uh, delivery line, which is five barrels delivered per minute, or I could have reinforced tools, plus 50% to the amount of goods produced in the small farm. So, I'm leaning towards barrel delivery line. The reason I'm leaning towards that is because by the time I can develop ale, which needs to go in a barrel, as you might imagine, I may just have enough barrels to do it, which means I wouldn't have to invest in making barrels. And barrels are wood made into planks and then barrels. So you need special buildings that change the wood into planks, unless you want to do it at a really bad exchange rate in the crude workstation, and then another special building to turn the plank into a barrel. I'm going to take the barrel delivery line and completely avoid that. Okay, woodcutters camp, you may now also take a bunch of folk. Excellent, excellent. Second shelter goes up. And that's the order complete. Now, trapper's camp and meat from those trapper's camps. Thankfully, we know, of course, the game is going to give us that. And... Ugh, that meat's actually kind of difficult to access. I'm going to have my trappers walk through the farm, basically, in order to access this. Slick shell broodmother. A small slick shell that is crawling out of openings in the broodmother's shell. It's easy to collect them. They give us meat and leather. Hey. Honestly, I should probably set the construction of this building as a higher priority. We can see the priority system here. I've set this as priority one. Everything else currently is priority zero. So anyone that is free will prioritize this over everything else. Like, these paths should not be built until the trapper's camp is. I guess this was already in the process of being built by other people, so the paths were able to be completed. The trapper's camp, you need to take the uh, lizards, because the lizards are 10% chance of doubling their yields in this area as a result of working with meat production. There is a lot to this farming fit. Whoa, there's even more farming down there. Hmm, beautiful. Actually, it looks like I opened a second glade. Yeah, at the same time, neat. This would also happily accept a trapper's camp or a scavenger's camp. There's also some clay in here. Honestly, it's unlikely that I'm gonna need to prioritize either of those. Just give me the meat. Please. You have the meats. I need the meats. Thank you. We deliver that immediately and find a smokehouse for our meats. A smokehouse can produce jerky, pottery, and incense. Also, we need to enable the meat in the jerky recipe. So we change the ingredient from insects to meat in the jerky recipe in the smokehouse. We'll show how that's done and make jerky in that smokehouse. So, first off, obviously, I need to get myself a smokehouse. Pop that bad boy down. It's, it's like best positioning right now. Honestly, this woodcutter's camp doesn't need to be there anymore. I'm actually going to put it down in the other area so that it can overlap, also open its way into this next glade. But in doing all of that, I then free up the area for a smokehouse. Neat. <laughs> actually... Hmm. 
Okay. I might move the smokehouse one that's, uh, once it's done building here. Newcomers, Herven Runebeek is asking us to welcome in either a lizard and human or a beaver and a human. I currently have non-beavers doing woodcutting, so I would really like to accept another beaver. Uh, where's the second? There we go. And then completely overtake the woodcutting industry with them. Corner that market. Smokehouse here is now asking me to enable meat in the recipe for Smokehouse. It's worth noting, at this point, I've enabled insects and meat. I can also just toggle them on and off individually. So currently, nothing will be accepted by this recipe. Now only meat, now meat and insects. Very important. The game doesn't super explain the, the toggle element of that all. Uh, and I ended up figuring it out. Not, not that it was... You know, uh, not that it was difficult or any of pat on the back or anything for doing it, but something I think I should take the time here to point out. Uh, where are the rest of the lizards? Oh, one of them's ancient hearth and two of them in the trapper's camp. That's okay. Sure, I'll just get people to... Oh my god, this... The smokehouse has warmth and it's meat production. There's no way I can put people in here. That's a lizard's job through and through. So I've now put a human in the hearth, and they are giving us Queen's Impatience grows 25% slower as their modifier. Uh, there we go. All three of you in there. Oh, I just realized pottery is made out of clay and wood. And pottery can be used to contain beer. Although, no, I have all the barrels, right? Yeah, 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 I got 50 barrels on me. That is fine. I'm not going to need them. So we'll turn off all the recipes and just let them make a bunch of jerky. They just delivered all of the jerky in a smooth sweep. Yeah. This is probably too many lizard workers here. Well, I guess it especially is because the trapper's camp is not currently generating any meat. Oops. That said, the smokehouse is about to generate 30 jerky, 10 in excess of what the game is even asking for. And I can show you that jerky is a complex food requirement for the lizards as well as the humans. So we can satisfy the lizards and the humans at the same time by making jerky. We can satisfy the humans and the beavers at the same time by making biscuits. Uh, we can satisfy the beavers and the lizards at the same time by making pickled goods, because they both have that. But you'll note that none of these is satisfying all three. Forcing us to diversify our production chains. Oh, baby. You seeing what I'm seeing down here? That is a lot of arable land. Now, let me get a small farm up next to it as well. Ah, uh, I see. The positioning of this is going to be difficult. What if I got this woodcutter's camp out of place? What I really want is the woodcutter's camp hunting down this area. Hmm. That position? That's not much better. Also not much better. I think there works, right? It's a far cry from the actual areas I want to be in, but... Oh no, I'm going to have to use a path going all the way around the outside. You know what? Honestly, I don't need two woodcutters camps at this point. That's what I say. And then prioritize cutting down those, thank you. Let's get the small farm I was looking for up and active. And in fact, I can just put it... Whoa, no, I can't. <laughs> Super far out of the area where I actually need it. Uh... Actually, that is incredible. Small farm can fit there, and I can just... track a path around to it. 
Realistically, this actually means I did not need to move the original woodcutter's camp, but sure, I don't need two woodcutter's camps at this point. Let's move that one over. The jerky in the smokehouse should be ready. In just a moment here. Perfect. Ah, a brewery. Enable barrels in the ale recipe. And then, brew some ale. Easy, easy, easy. Especially because you've given me the brewery in order to do it. The brewery is capable of three-star production of ale, one-star production of pickled goods, and one-star production of a pack of crops. And it takes two planks, two bricks, and two fabric in order to construct. Food. Your villagers need to eat in order to survive. Every few minutes, they'll go on break, gathering around the hearth, trying to eat something edible from the warehouse. If nothing they like is available, like pickled goods for the beavers, they will eat raw food. If there's no food, however, they'll get one stack of hunger. Each stack works as a resolve penalty, and if the resolve of the species reaches zero, they'll start leaving the settlement. Even if you grow vegetables on your farms, the amount of food you produce will soon become inefficient for a growing population. This is the important part, and why I really wanted to read this tooltip. The solution is to process raw food and thus multiply it. As most recipes in the game yield more goods than raw ingredients used to produce them. Some perks can further increase that ratio, or even generate additional food as a byproduct. So building the complexity of Chain in order to satisfy the, the requirements of these characters is also building towards the actual efficiency of resource management in terms of food. Uh, we'll also see that system uh, reinforced and echoed multiple times over the course of the rest of the game design. Yay. I really like this game. Ah, uh, small farm! Let's put some people in that. Uh, where's some other peoples, though? Trapper's camp? Yeah, you can you can lose one. That's fine. Get everyone doing their favorite job in farming. So, I will actually preset. I don't even have to wait for the brewery to be ready for me to select barrel usage there. Also, Grain. We only have six? How? We have a small farm and it farms two star grain. This is an outrage. The humans, again, actually really enjoy brewing. So maybe I should get a human on this task. You know what? The smokehouse, I'm going to take two of the lizards out of the smokehouse. And the reason I'm doing that is because we just don't have enough meat to actually have three lizards consistently generating jerky in there. And we probably don't have enough people who want jerky even. Like we've got 27 jerky and currently only two humans have eaten it. They treat it as quite suspect apparently. So I'm gonna get a human back out of the hearth and put you in the brewery. And yeah, I'm currently like gated by the amount of grain that I have. So a second human in here would not be able to help me make more ale faster. They'd be able to deliver some barrels. But that's about it. Please build more grain. I mean, actually, hang on, plant fiber. Do I use that? No, I can only use grain or roots in order to make ale. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like I have any other... Yeah, no, I have no other sources of that on the map except for my farms. That makes sense. The game obviously wants to teach you to actually use the farms. Ooh! Our lizards aren't particularly picky. With just a little bit of jerky, they've already reached their resolve limit of 15 and are starting to generate some reputation per minute. Ah! Unfortunately, it was immediately taken away. You'll note that we are currently in Storm. This is the second season of the first year. And in Storm, some negatives are happening. Forest Mystery Simple Looming Darkness says, The rampaging storm stifles the spirit of all living creatures. Add an additional stack of this effect for each hostility level. Negative four to global resolve. Making it harder to keep everyone happy, obviously. 
It's active from hostility zero and only in the season storm. And then there's also regular storm, which is only active from hostility one upwards, but homeless villagers have a 10% chance of dying every 60 seconds from the storm. We can prevent the negative outcome here if we just house everyone. So let's get a little proactive about that and pop down another house and home. Uh, there. And sure, I'll future-proof a little. We've got some free builders. They have some time on their hands. They can get that done. I'm also going to move the trapper's camp up, just to be closer to the actual things that it is trying to trap. All's well, all's well, all's well. See how far they expect you to possibly be able to expand? We're, we haven't shown anything off yet. Ugh! I should have also noted, oh my god, I didn't note it at the very start because I did the RTS thing. Uh, this game is in early access. It is uh, more than content enough complete for me to currently take a little bit of a dive into, but if you are using this to inform your own purchasing decisions, then be aware the game is currently in early access. Efficient brewing, plus 50% of the amount of goods brewed in the brewery. There's also grain bags, uh, specialized grain farming techniques, grain production is increased by one for every 25 times it's produced. That's really important. Hang on, I selected that, right? Oh, yeah, bring some grain. Bring some grain, please. Um, I did select the, the grain production one, right? Yeah, oh, grain bags. There it is. So this is important because this is a way for me to demonstrate through my laborious devotion to making grain that I intend to make a lot of grain. And then the game goes, yeah, you're making a lot of grain? How about you have some grain about it? And then we have more grain. Obviously very important world where I want to make a bunch of beer. Speaking of, how's that going? Let's get another human in there. We've got more grain. We should have the ability. That's enough ale in the brewery. And now you want me to serve that ale in a tavern. The objective is to build a tavern, a place where villagers can fulfill their need for leisure or brawling. Also has a passive effect of Gleeman's Tales. And we need to fulfill their need for leisure 20 times. Let's do it. So, the tavern itself is obviously going to be the new blueprint that they're offering us here. And let's slam this bad boy down. Right about here? Yeah. We need two more fabric and one more plank in order to actually construct this in the first place. And I don't have a crude workstation, do I? Okay, so the only reason I am so close to being able to construct that in the first place is because of the rewards that I got from earlier missions. So now I just need to very quickly also put down a crude workstation and build just a little bit of planks and a little bit of fabric. Come on. Just very, very quickly. Oh, Okay, there's lit enough fabric to make some... Or enough plant matter to make some fabric. As well as enough wood to make some planks. Yeah, two of each is actually enough for me. So as soon as they finish each of their productions here, two fabric, two plank, uh, I am going to force delivery. There we go. Take those into the main bank, and then those will be delivered to the tavern itself, the construction. And after that, I mean, you know, I don't need either of you in that job anymore. Go help some of the constructions if you can. Not that there's much going on. I think it's possible you can only assign one... No, 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 there's two builders doing this at the same time. Hmm, maybe two people can build a thing at the same time. Anyhow, the tavern is now open. Let's throw some folk on in there. 
Gleeman's Tales is the passive effect here. Gleeman's Tales, every evening, a Gleeman tells stories about past glories and times before the Great Civil War. Plus three to Global Resolve. Same building effects do not stack, so I couldn't just build another tavern and tell more tall tales. Come on. Everyone needs to drink. Go to the tavern, please. That's all you need to do. Everyone's real happy about this. Everyone's real high on their resolve. But only seven people want to have any fun. Come on. Live a little. Have a drop. Drink a dram. Come on. Got a whole town of teetotalers. Look at them all hanging out by the fire. What are you doing doing nothing when you could be drunk about it? It's so... It's so available. Hmm. I think I will take more lizards here. And then I will house them immediately. Noting that lizards are easier to keep happy than people. And easier to keep having than beavers as well. Come on. Just a wee bit more leisure. Interesting. So now we can see an idle building icon. Idle building. No one in the building is working. Unassigned idle builders or change recipes. So we have two people in here who are comfortable. But there is not enough grain to produce any ale right now. So I'm going to take them both out. Although we are about to get more grain. We're about to see that pop up here, I imagine. Place for rest, immediately completing that. Uh, we also have one more objective immediately afterwards, which says, Humans resolve. Keep humans resolve above 25 for 30 seconds, which we've already completed, so we'll immediately turn that in, getting even more mold supply. Yes, you can stack perks to the same effects. I, well, actually, hang on. I was about to say stack similar perks, like grain bag, what we got earlier. Uh... Which you can stack grain bag, but this is not grain bag. This is mold supply. It's just plus one to grain production rather than asking me to invest first. Also, 20 in a bundle of reeds. We deliver that immediately, and now the game is asking us to make provisions. Goods packed for delivery, useful for fulfilling orders or trading, and it's produced by a makeshift post, a provisioner, or a manufacturer. Yes, yes. I can, I could house some beavers if I really wanted to, but I'm just gonna get that makeshift post. I think putting that down and completing our mission is the go here. So we'll see that the makeshift post is capable of producing packs of crops and packs of building material, as well as packs of provisions. So each of these will accept different things. We can see the roots accept alternatives of mushrooms and vegetables and grain. The provisions accept eggs, meat, insects, berries, and herbs, and building materials, planks, copper ore, bricks, and fabric. So noting that I'm producing... I guess eggs and insects, most of all here. I probably, do I wanna? I don't need to jerk anything more. Eh, stop jerking that meat and give us the ability to pack it for provisions for later. Two lizards storing in the makeshift post there. Should be all good in just a couple of seconds. And there it goes. I actually didn't even complete the mission. We rolled over there just because we'd satisfied people enough. And that is very important. You do not need to complete all of the orders. If you get enough happiness just out of satisfying the needs of your villagers, bully, well done. That is totally a way to win as well. Uh, level two, new citadel upgrades. There's also a rain collector, a new essential building that can produce spark dew. Uh, paved roads, roads made out of stone, giving a 50% increase. There's also herbalist camp, a starting point for herbalists to go out into the wild and gather herbs, berries, and mushrooms. Meat specialization, which is a new cornerstone we've unlocked. You've managed to enlist some excellent hunters. Meat production is increased by one for every 25 times it's produced. Flame amulets, 
uh, a new cornerstone as well. An artifact infused with the power of the Holy Flame. Hostility from woodcutters is decreased by four. I guess it's worth noting at this point that you gain additional hostility from the woods for each of the woodcutters that you have. And crowded houses. All rooms have room for one more villager. You also get another 10 in the food stockpiles, as well as unlock the content of a shelter, a makeshift post, a blight post. A specialized building dedicated to fighting blight rot. Blight fighters will prepare fire during drizzles and clearance seasons and use it to burn blight rot cysts during the storm. I've literally never seen this, and I've played like a couple of runs of this to check out it's something that I'm interested in. Interesting. Hydrant is also an essential building. Small storage for purging fire. Blight fighters will use it to restock their fuel when fighting Blight Rod in the storm. I just don't think I've encountered that yet. That may be a later game kind of thing that is just unlocked here early for us. The Queen's Envoy says, The world is a vast, ever-changing place, and its heart lies in the smoldering city. Er? Your goal as a Viceroy is to rebuild it, secure the future of the Queen's subjects. Use the resources you've gathered so far to construct the Obsidian Archive in the smoldering city. I'll go there immediately and do so. By upgrades and Obsidian Archive level one. Here we see the absolutely monstrous upgrade tree that we have the ability to persist down here. At the very top, we'll see a modifier that is kind of small, but ultimately they will stack with importance. The base stat here being Queen's Patience, you gain a permanent negative 2% speed for the impatience growing. However, what we really care about here is Obsidian Archive, a place where records about great viceroys are kept. We unlock deeds, so I'll unlock that there, and then I have the option to take either the next level of Obsidian Archive, which gives us another 2% to the uh, Queen's Impatience growing slower, but importantly, an additional 10% to Citadel resources whenever we finish a settlement. So that is faster leveling in this screen, as well as Monastery of the Vigilant Flame. Uh, Everlasting Flames, you gain a permanent plus 2% to the burning duration of all types of fuel. And also, you get the new embarkation bonuses of Stone and Clay. We'll have a look at what those mean later, but for the moment, I am going to unlock faster resource generation here for us and hop across to deeds this is what we have previously unlocked the deeds are kind of achievements ish but they also give you in-game rewards and they are tracked per save file so for instance winning a game on prestige 15 difficulty or higher will give me a steel matic cornerstone stone can now be produced in the clay pit or uh, win a game on the Cursed Royal Woodlands Biome, giving us a wall crossing, an essential building, which is this, uh, a decoration, actually. So they do have uh, varyingly useful unlocks behind them, and all of the books, by the way, are just amounts of experience, which will upgrade our Viceroy level and also unlock more things for us to be able to do. So we're not going to be extremely heavily, I imagine, focusing on trying to uh, knock out these Glade missions, but if I notice myself getting close to any of them, I mean, sure, it tips us in the direction of what we might want to next do. That said... The Queen's Envoy continues. This world is governed by an eternal Blightstorm cycle. It is almost upon us, so no caravans are allowed to embark. Click on the button in the bottom right corner of the screen to finish the cycle. So we can see here that Tutorial Town 1 and 2 came along early, but up until this part of the year, that is to say this whole purple bottom uh, bar is our year's progress, We've completed almost the entirety of the year. So sure. Let's end. The cycle summary is the Blightstorm is coming. Your settlements have been abandoned and your people have returned to the Citadel. We have gathered over the course of our missions here 20 in our foot stockpiles and we have unlocked content. Queen's Patience and Obsidian Archive as well as Queen's Patience and more Citadel resources. Experience gained this cycle, 150 total. We now end the cycle. That is what we may consider an individual run of this game. Now the Blightstorm occurs, 
Thankfully, all of us are holed up in that citadel. And retreats. You're almost ready to venture out on your own. Choose any map tile inside your embarkation range to begin. So we can see the embark range here is furthest at two away from the main. Choose any map tile inside your embarkation tile. So this map tile here looks kind of interesting. A lot of different biomes covered. Uh, and it is a... Well, hang on. To embark, you must first choose a caravan that will become the foundation of your town's population. We get to choose here between four humans and four lizards or eight humans. It's also worth noting, we will not know what the final race is just yet. There are four races, but only three of them can show up in any individual run. Next, choose a difficulty. The higher the risk, the greater the reward. But beware, an inexperienced Viceroy won't last long on higher difficulties. Lastly, use all of your embarkation points to take extra goods with you. You are finally ready to embark on your own. Remember, there's always a way out. Experiment and adapt. That is very, very, very true. You can pull it back from some of the most dire situations in this game. May the storm be bent, uh, gentle on you, Viceroy. And you too, Queen's Envoy. So it's currently recommending that I go for a settler run here. For villagers eating less food. I'm going to go with Pioneer, which is going to be base-ish difficulty. Uh, more reputation is going to be required to win in order to get through this one here. We can also see some of the modifiers that are active in this area. We can see the severity of this area is taxing, but there are three additional effects. One being Royal Outpost. The proximity of a Royal Outpost makes it easier to communicate with the Crown. The pool of order choices will increase by one. Royal Archaeologists. Every Viceroy embarking on an expedition to the Scarlet Orchard is assigned a Royal Archaeologist. You also get a new building, the Archaeologist's Office, and Buried Mysteries. A lush and exotic land filled with prehistoric remains. Ancient excavation sites may be found here. Possibly another methodology that we could use to increase our grace with the Queen. That said, for the moment, my name has been Rhapsody. I understand that we only got through the two tutorials here in the very start. But that sets us up perfectly to begin our first real run in the next episode. It's very important that we go through the tutorialization at the very start of this. I do apologize about the tutorial being the whole first episode. But... I think it's very important to set up for what we're about to do. For the moment, my name's been Rhapsody. Hopefully you've been enjoying yourselves, and hopefully we will see y'all next time.